Good morning. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, um, my name is Hannah. I'm the managing editor of the Harvard Crimson. Um, it is my honor to introduce Frank Lamonti, uh, the director of the Breckner Center for Freedom of Information, who will be speaking about <coughs> press rights, giving you a detailed rundown of the laws that protect student-run media outlets and your rights as a student journalist. Prior to joining the Breckner Center, Frank served as executive director of the Student Press Law Center for almost a decade. While there, he fought for legislation meant to better protect students and educators against institutional retaliation for their journalism. His efforts spearheading the New Voices USA movement, which he still co-chairs, led to augmented legal protections in several states. Frank also oversaw national award-winning investigative journalism while helming the SPLC, including reporting centered on issues of college and school transparency. Before that, uh, he worked as a lawyer and as a political columnist and investigative reporter. There are few, if any, people better qualified to teach us about our rights as student journalists. Please join me in welcoming Frank with a round of applause. Awesome. Thank you so much. Good morning. Whoa, that's a lot of miking going on there. Okay. <laughs> um, so thank you. I'm going to um, blow through a lot in a short time here. And because I know that we're pretty tightly scheduled, um, I've got tons and tons of uh, my business cards for anybody that wants to follow up. Um, I myself have got to get on a plane and go to I'm on a uh, six-day, four-campus uh, tour. This is number three, and I go to St. Louis uh, after this this afternoon um, to knock it out. So uh, I'm uh, delighted to spend a few minutes with you here. I'm just going to take the podium mic off so that you're not. <laughs> OK. I thought that's a lot going on. Right. Or I could just step away from that. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, I can't really. <laughs> Maybe, yeah, yeah it's OK just... if you don't want to stand closer. Okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, let's do that. I'll just yeah. step away from it. How about that? Yeah. All right. Does that work for you? OK. <laughs> Kevin, good. OK, Thank you. wonderful. Sorry. Okay, let's dive in again. <laughs> so um, I, I am going to show you some uh, resources uh, 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 quickly here and then get into talking about kind of the greatest hits of um, legal questions that people ask to the Student Press Law Center because the backbone of the work that SPLC has been doing for over 40 years is taking calls from student journalists around the country who have questions about their legal rights or run into obstacles when they're gathering or reporting news. It's a free service. They love hearing from you. And um, there are over 200 volunteer lawyers as part of the SPLC network who can uh, actually take cases to court if they have to. Um, we came very close to having to do that um, just this past week at the Wichita State University. I don't know how many of you follow uh, news of what's going on in college media, but they had a threat of a 50% retaliatory budget cut at Wichita State in, uh, uh, in direct response to some investigative reporting that their program did. And so uh, that's why resources like the SPLC exist, to be kind of a counterweight to that institutional censorship. Um, so in addition to the SPLC.org uh, website, where you'll see there are a number of webinars, uh, tutorials, uh, handouts for your staff. Um, uh, podcasts, uh, uh, news alerts that you can subscribe to, and they do have paid internships three times a year, spring, summer, uh, and fall. Um, uh, the, uh, we mentioned just briefly the New Voices US uh, movement to pass laws that protect the independence of student journalism around the country. Thankfully, most of you here, I see we're very Ivy heavy this year, uh, most of you already have, thanks to your financial independence, um, a degree of separation from your institutions where you don't generally have to worry about some administrator telling you what you can and can't publish. But for those of you who don't have that financial independence, it is wonderful to have the comfort of a state statute that insulates you against the institution telling you what you can and can't publish. We're up to 14 states that have those protections right now. I'm sorry to say um, I see Michigan and Florida represented. You are not among them, but we are working on that. Um, and uh, uh, we did just pass one in Rhode Island. I saw Brown University here in Brown. Uh, uh, you are uh, really in luck because Rhode Island is one of the very few of the 14 states that was willing to extend the protection to private as well as to public institutions. It's quite rare to get a legislature to do that. So uh, in, uh, in Rhode Island and in California, um, private institution students have legally protected freedom 
freedom of the press that can't be taken away by their institutions. Um, two resources, and I was a reporter uh, as long as I was a practicing attorney. I still kind of think of myself um, as a reporter. The best job I'll ever have was being the editor of my newspaper at the University of Florida, <laughs> um, and yay. Uh, and, and so the, uh, I, I, I come at this um, from as much a reporter's uh, standpoint as a lawyer's standpoint. And with my reporter hat on, I just want to recommend two resources resources for you. Um, if you're not already subscribing to uh, Inside Higher Ed, it's a free uh, service and I would definitely advise getting on their daily uh, alert list. Um, you'll get a digest of news about what's going on in the field of higher ed um, and you'll almost always walk away with a story idea, some trend or some phenomenon going on that you can localize. Um, so that's a really uh, a really good resource for you to know about. This other one is, does anybody belong to Education Writers Association? Um, EWA is a free organization to join for students. Um, they give free memberships. And when you join, you'll be on their email listserv where you can post questions to them about any story that you're stuck on. You can actually call. They have a, a very experienced and wonderful education journalist Emily Richmond, who is the public editor. Um, she's kind of a troubleshooter. Uh, she is to journalism what SPLC is to law. It's a free hotline where you can call and get journalism advice. And also, they have really excellent training events around the country for which students can often get a totally free ride. Um, so uh, I, I definitely advise subscribing to that. And uh, for those of you who are job hunting, they have a very good job board, too. Um, so uh, having flagged those resources for you, let me sort of dive in and get started. And um, if, if you have a question that uh, you want to uh, jump in on or a story that you want to share about an experience that you've had, feel free to do that along the way or else I'll try to save time at the end. Um, before I, I start talking about the, um, uh, the law, I do want to say, first of all, thanks so much to Neiman and Harvard for making this really, really rare opportunity available because I think you know working in that college newsroom, stuff is flying past you 100 miles an hour in addition to all the other things called life um, that are on your plate. And that opportunity to just kind of decompress and get into a really beautiful setting like this one where you can mindfully think about your journalism is so, so rare. So take full advantage of that and cherish it. And do think about as you go through the rest of not just your college career, but your career career, Finding those moments, finding those kind of me moments where you can de-stress a little bit and think about your practice of journalism and your craft and why it is that you do what you do and how you can do it better because so many of us just get caught up in the hamster wheel and we don't take time to think about that and, and that's what will uh, produce the stories that you're most proud of is that, uh, that, that moment of zen where you just uh, take, take a few minutes to decompress and think about why is it that we do what we do. Um, I, I'm not a big war story guy, but I, I can't not share with you um, from, from my college journalism life, um, and again, this is more reporting than legal, but um, when um, I, 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 no one has ever loved being a college journalist more than me, and um, I was a very, very tireless beat walker. Um, um, I wore out um, a lot of Nikes um, going around the uh, campus, just knocking on people's doors. If you were any person in a position of authority at the University of Florida, you were going to get multiple visits from me. Just plop down to your guest chair, flip open the notepad, what's going on in your day? And uh, because I walked the beat a lot, I got a lot of serendipitous stories, but none that will stick with me more than the one when uh, I was walking out of the university administration building and a guy in blue coveralls, old, older guy in blue coveralls with a broom, stopped me and said, you're that guy from the newspaper, right? Yeah, I'm that guy. Yeah, I'm that guy. And uh, he said, I want to talk to you about something. And he calls me over to a little uh, janitor break room, and he shows me a memo that the janitors had gotten. And it said that the university vice president for administrative affairs had put out a new policy saying that henceforth, um, all of the aluminum cans that were left in the recycling bins on campus were regarded as university property and if any employees were caught taking the cans out of the bins they would be prosecuted for theft that was the memo and he tells me frank for years and years as long as i've been here we the janitors have been taking those cans and going down to the local recycling center and turning them in for, for money and what we do with them is is we put it all into a pool and at the end of the year that's how we pay for the janitor's christmas party and he tells me, Frank, they're stealing our Christmas. They're stealing our Christmas. 
And you better believe that was six columns across the top of the Wednesday front page of the University of Florida newspaper. They're stealing our Christmas with a screenshot of this memo. That was the Wednesday front page. The Thursday front page was the demonstration. Um, that was the, uh, the protest where the uh, janitorial staff and their supporters all walked out uh, with science saying, keep your hands off our cans. Uh, and, and the Friday story was the vice president rescinding the memo. Um, and, and so that was the kind of story that, you know, it's not great investigative journalism. It's just putting yourself in a position to be lucky. And if I could give you one piece of reporting advice, it's that. Stories will rain on you, but only if you go outside. You have to put yourself in a position to be lucky. Um, and if you do that, good things like that will happen to you. And I'll never forget that story. Um, and I, I'll, never, I'll, I'll, I'll never not enjoy telling it. Um, with that, let's do the law. Um, this is a biggie, not just for college journalists, but for, for, for professional journalists, because there is widespread misunderstanding about the ability to take photos, shoot video in public spaces. And it turns out that the rights of journalists are much broader than the average person thinks, and the right of privacy is much narrower than the average person thinks. It is not at all uncommon for uh, police officers or just ordinary citizens to say, hey, stop shooting that video, stop taking my photograph, I didn't give you permission to do that. And the answer to that question is, you gave me permission to do that when you walked out of your house this morning. There is no privacy law that protects against the journalistic use of your image when you are standing in a place where you are at risk of being seen by strangers. And I use that phrase, standing in a place where you're at, use, uh, at risk of being seen by strangers, and not public property. I, I, I purposefully use that phrase because the right of privacy uh, extends only to places that are truly the kind of place where you would never expect to be seen by a stranger. The kind of place where you frankly might be comfortable changing your clothes. A place where you're comfortable changing your clothes is a place where you have a privacy right. A hotel room, a locker room, a hospital room, a nursing home room, a dorm room, right? Any place you'd be comfortable changing your clothes is a place where you have a privacy expectation. Outside of that, you really have none. And so even when I'm on privately owned non-governmental property, the lobby of a hotel, a shopping mall, a McDonald's, when I'm in one of those places, I am assuming the risk that my photograph is going to be taken by a journalist. And I have no legal authority to control that whether it is used or how it is used. The only legal authority that I have is the ability to control the commercialization of my image, right? So you are free to take that photograph or shoot that video and use it for journalistic or artistic purposes. The only thing you can't do with it is put it in an ad without my consent, right? So McDonald's cannot put my face in their ad, or you can't put my face in the ad and say, I endorse this product or I endorse this business. Now you've gone too far. But for journalistic purposes or documentary filming or storytelling purposes, when I stepped outside the door of my house, I assumed the risk that I would show up in your shot. Now, you may make ethical and professional judgments not to use those images. Of course, that happens all the time. If somebody strongly objects for some legitimate reason, you know, it's a battered spouse who's fleeing from her abusive husband and she doesn't want to show up in the news because that might help him track her down, of course your ethics will tell you not to use that image, right? But for the, for the most part, um, any shot that you take of a person that you can see with your own two eyes is yours to use. By the way, that includes kids. It is widely, widely misperceived that there's some kind of children's invisibility law in America. That is not a thing. You will hear me say this many times today. It is not a thing. There is no children's invisibility law. There are a handful of children's privacy laws that apply to the people who have children's records, right? Like a juvenile court or like a uh, child welfare agency, yes. They have confidentiality duties to protect those records. You have none. If you get a picture of a four-year-old playing in a playground and you need to use it for some journalistic purpose, go right ahead and it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the parents don't like it or not. That is your photo to do with what you want. Um, and there is no special rule about posting online. Another myth that people sometimes have this idea that I can control how my image or my images of my children are used online. Again, not a thing. 
we'll talk in a little more depth in a minute about interactions with police, but uh, just know that it is never, never within the authority of police to either confiscate your images or destroy them. That is not within their authority. Will they try to do it anyway? Sometimes, yes. And we'll talk about how to kind of get your way out of that. But that is certainly never within their legal authority to do. Now, having said all this, you got plenty of rights to photograph and shoot video and, and record audio, but you don't get a journalistic pass to break the law. And so you have no inferior rights to the general public, but also no superior rights to the general public. You don't get to say, right, if there's a, a march going on, let's say, and you want to cover this march, and your shot would be better if you stood in the middle of a busy intersection and put your tripod there, but you'd also be obstructing traffic, right? You don't get a free pass to violate laws that apply to everybody else just because you're doing something journalistic. You can be uh, uh, cited for uh, blocking traffic or for trespassing on somebody's private lawn or uh, damaging property going through a police uh, a barricade, right? Any of the things that would apply to you and me as citizens apply equally to you and me as journalists. You don't get a uh, journalistic right to break the law. Um, and this has happened, by the way. Uh, I've had to get journalists out of jail um, for doing all of these things. And uh, thankfully, uh, police and prosecutors don't tend to have that much appetite for actually prosecuting um, journalists. And oftentimes, you can uh, just get the charges to go away. But that's what the SPLC uh, lawyer uh, hotline is for. Um, it turns out that the First Amendment is very, very, very clear about the right to publish news once you have it. So once there is news in your possession or information in your possession, we have 50 years of unbroken Supreme Court precedent saying you have an absolute right to publish that material. That we're clear on. It turns out that the First Amendment is not nearly so clear on the right to gather the news in the first place. It is not nearly so clear whether the First Amendment guarantees you a right to be where the news is or to stay where the news is. For that, we have to rely on court interpretations or sometimes state statutes. Now, this is the one point where I think we are really, really clear that the First Amendment protects the right not just to publish the news you already have, but the right to go out and gather it. And that is when you're photographing or filming the police, doing police stuff in a place that is visible to the public. The courts are now unanimous, including right here. We're in the First Circuit here in, uh, in Massachusetts. Um, the courts are now unanimous that there is a constitutionally protected right to stand in that space as long as your feet are planted in a place where it's legal to plant them and to take your photos or shoot you video even if the police object to it, as sometimes they're known to do. Um, uh, the Glick case is a good example of that. took place right here at Harvard, actually. There was a, a struggle going on among uh, police and a uh, suspect um, on, the, on the quad um, at Harvard. And a bystander decided to whip out the smartphone and record this. Um, and uh, the police decided that they didn't like being recorded, and so they, uh, uh, they, they, they cited uh, Mr. Glick actually for violating a law against eavesdropping. Um, they claimed that he was an unlawful uh, uh, eavesdropper because he picked up their voices um, on his uh, smartphone. And uh, the uh, First Circuit Court of Appeals, which is rung, one rung beneath the Supreme Court, came back with the judgment saying, no, you can't charge people with doing that. You can't prosecute people for doing nothing more than recording the activities of the police doing police business in a, in a place that's visible to the public eye. And they, they kind of stressed, each one of these uh, court interpretations has stressed, that we have a uniquely compelling need to see what the police are up to, right? And we all know this now, right? That the events of the last two and a half years have taught us that if we don't see recordings of what the police are up to, sometimes they're up to no good. Um, and so the, uh, the courts are now quite clear that it is a constitutionally protected right to stay there and shoot that video or shoot those photographs. Um, of everything I'm going to show you today, this is my favorite thing and the thing that I hope you'll most remember, and that is the Federal Privacy Protection Act. And the reason I hope you'll remember this is because almost nobody else does. Um, this is an amazingly powerful federal law that people have largely forgotten exists because it was passed all the way back in 1980 and it doesn't get talked about all that much. Thankfully, because cops don't violate it all that often, but every once in a while they do something really screwy and the law needs to come to your rescue. So um, I'll give you a, a little history about how this came into being. Um, it actually starts in a college newsroom. 
Uh, back in the 1970s, during the Vietnam uh, era anti-war protests, some protesters occupied the administration building at Stanford University in California. And they did some property damage, and the police decided that they were going to prosecute all these um, protesters, but they couldn't catch them all. So they figured, well, who's going to have photographs of this? The Stanford Daily will. And they can make our jobs a lot easier. We'll just go grab all their cameras and look inside of them, and then we can identify our suspects and we can prosecute them. And that's what they do. They show up at the newsroom of the Stanford Daily, and they raid the newsroom. This is before digital photographs, right? So there's film. So they actually take the physical cameras and take the film, and they go uh, 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 pro uh, process the images, and they make their arrests. Um, Stanford Daily, uh, uh, understandably, finds this objectionable. Um, they bring a constitutional claim under both the First Amendment, right, freedom of expression, and here's a government agency that's done something to interfere with my freedom of expression, but also the Fourth Amendment, right? Fourth Amendment is what the Constitution uh, 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 protects us against illegal searches and seizures, right? And so they claim, well, this is an illegal search and seizure. Goes all the way up to the US Supreme Court, which in 1979 comes back and says, we don't see any problem here. Um, they had a warrant from a judge, and that's all the police need to go search anybody's property, whether that's a business or a home. They followed the letter of the law, they got their warrant, and they get to do this. Congress says, well, we will fix that. And they come back the next year in 1980, and they pass the Privacy Protection Act. And the Privacy Protection Act says that when any government official, and notice it's any government official, not just police, um, wants to either seize or search a place where journalists keep their unpublished work product. It is not enough to just get a warrant. A warrant is good enough for your house or my house or your car or my car. And as a normal rule, right, if a citizen is presented with a warrant, the answer is, come right in, officer. Let me open the door for you. You've got to comply. You go to jail. Um, and a warrant is issued by a magistrate, usually, without you even knowing about it. That's the whole point, right? I want to search you without you being able to flush the drugs down the toilet. And so I'm going to go to the magistrate. I'm going to get him to sign the warrant or her to sign a warrant. And I'm going to show up at your door without you knowing about it. Congress said, no, that's not good enough for newsrooms. That's not good enough for journalists. We want you to have advance warning. And so what the Privacy Protection Act says is that when that knock comes on your door and that warrant is presented to you, you get to say no. You get to keep the door shut and say, come back to me after we've had a hearing in front of the judge where I get to be represented by my own lawyer to argue why my work is privileged and shouldn't be turned over to you. So this is like the one place in the law where journalists actually get better protection than civilians do, is you get to say no to searches that anybody else would have to say yes to. Give me an example of how this works. So a couple of years ago, and by the way, I, we know it works for college journalists because it was meant for college journalists. It was meant for the Stanford Daily. A um, couple of years ago, there was a horrible fatal shooting at Purdue University. It was a, um, a graduate TA who had a grudge against a professor and shot the professor to death at Purdue. And of course, the Purdue Exponent newspaper is right there on the spot, and their photographer is the first journalist on the scene. And he manages to get not right into the crime scene, but very close to the crime scene, too close for the comfort of the police, who decide they're going to wrestle him to the ground and take away all his cameras. And they take him into custody, claiming that he trespassed onto a crime scene and, uh, and hang on to his cameras. Well, they they decide to let him go. They don't charge him with the trespass charge. But they say, we're going to keep your cameras a little while here. We want to look inside and see if maybe you've got some evidence that might be useful to us. So uh, SPLC actually got on the phone with the lawyer for Purdue, uh, sent them a copy of Privacy Protection Act, and presto, the cameras were released um, because it would have been a violation of federal law. It was already a violation if they took them in the first place. It would have been an even worse violation if they had looked inside of them. Um, and so uh, we know it works. Um, we know it works. It's a good thing to know. And notice, even though I mentioned newsrooms, even though this was passed in the context of a newsroom, it doesn't say newsroom in the law. It says place where journalists store their work. What is a place that you store your work? Here, right? This is a newsroom. And so if the police were to take this phone away from you and confiscate it because they think that you have images in there or recordings in there that might be of interest to them, they are violating the Privacy Protection Act. And if they look inside, they just violated it twice. Um, and so that's how we know that it is not legal for the police at a crime scene to take that camera away from you and destroy the images inside. Right? They've now committed a seizure under the Privacy Protection Act. They did it without a court hearing. Um, and they don't get to do that. Now, what do you do if this happens? Well, 
in the fullness of time, it is possible to bring a damages suit. We see some examples of this. Um, um, the police can be forced to pay damages to people whose uh, images they destroy or erase. Of course, that doesn't do you any good. You don't want to lose them in the first place. You want the images. You don't want the money. My money's nice, but you, know, you want the images. Um, and so if you are at that scene, if you're at that person who has to kind of talk your way out of that confrontation, my number one kind of practical tip for you is, if it is at all possible to do this, try to get an editor on your phone and let that person be your advocate, right? If I was engaged in that confrontation with the police and the officer was trying to take my camera away or telling me you have to erase the pictures off of that, I would at least try, and it's really hard to keep your head about you at a moment like this, I would at least try saying, look, you know, my boss is a huge, giant jerk. And if I come back with a camera with no pictures in it, I'm going to get fired. Can you talk to my editor and explain why I have to surrender these pictures? And all the while you're doing that, you're dialing, 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 dialing. Boom. Now you got the editor on the speakerphone. That person is in a much safer position to be the advocate than you because that person's in here and they're not going to jail. So they can argue more forcefully than you can. And also, even if you lose the argument, it's a good idea to have an open line of communication to the newsroom. Why? Because sometimes cops arrest people. And if, if you have the arrest and you have a person witnessing the arrest by phone, at least they know what went down and they also know where to come and look for you. We actually had this happen a couple years ago. Y'all remember Occupy Wall Street, right? Occupy Wall Street, so there was an Occupy Tampa, there's an Occupy Nashville, there's an Occupy every place, no doubt Occupy Boston, right? There was an Occupy Atlanta. And at Occupy Atlanta, there was a photojournalist from the Georgia State University newspaper who literally lived um, across the street from where the protests were so she could see them out her window. So she wakes up one morning and she uh, uh, sees a protest. And so she grabs her camera and just sort of swings into action and assigns herself to cover this thing goes down, and within minutes of arriving on the scene, she winds up stepping her foot in the wrong place where the police didn't want her to step, and boom, she's in handcuffs, and she's going to jail. Well, because she wasn't on assignment from the newspaper, they had no idea she was even there. And so if you are imagining yourself as an editor, right, and one of your photographers doesn't come to work the next day, probably your first instinct is not let's call the county jail, right? Probably first instinct is they're hung over, right? Yeah, that's what you first assume. They blew off work, right? It's going to take you two or three days to get around to figuring out, you know, God, we haven't seen Sarah in a while. Let's start calling the local jails, right? So having that open phone line to your newsroom can save that person um, two very uncomfortable nights in a bunk bed um, in the county's accommodations. Um, it wound up, by the way, we, uh, we got her out after one night um, in jail only because her arrest was on the front page of the Atlanta Constitution, and she was wearing her Georgia State shirt at the time. And so the um, advisor recognized her and called me up on Sunday morning and said, I think that um, one of my photographers is in the county jail. Um, so uh, yeah, uh, uh, don't let that be you if you can avoid it. <laughs> um, I, I, and uh, I, I definitely do, you know, do, do when you go out to a scene like that of a protest, a demonstration, you know, some crazy celebration, uh, you know, uh, uh, Michigan may seem crazy, wins the NCAA basketball tournament, right? Uh, uh, something like that. Uh, 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 be prepared, at least in the back of your mind, that I may find myself in an adverse situation with police and you know, think through, what am I going to do if that happens? What am I going to do if that happens? Um, here's another one that um, uh, is going to probably blow the minds of some people in this room. This is a big, big, big complaint that I've been receiving at SPLC and is not at all limited to colleges and not at all limited to student journalists. So anybody here, just show of hands, who's at an institution where no one but the public relations person is allowed to give interviews or speak to the media or every interview has to go through a PR office? No hands? That's great. Oh, I see one hand. What institution? Am I telling you? Get out. OK. Well, so. And? Florida A&M. Florida A&M. Okay, so interesting. One private and one public. So we have a slide for each of you. Uh, so so the, the contrary to what a lot of public relations people have been trained, it is not a quote unquote best practice to tell all the employees in the organization that they can't give interviews. It is in fact an illegal practice to tell everybody that they can't give interviews. Um, at a public institution where the First Amendment applies, right? If you work for a public institution, then you're a government employee, which means the First Amendment applies. 
recognize. It is a First Amendment violation to tell everybody in the organization you are forbidden from speaking to the news media. Now, they can enforce narrower rules, right? They could say, don't give away confidential information. That they could do. Or they could say, don't hold yourself out claiming to be an official spokesperson for the university when you're not. That they can do. But if the policy says or the rule says, do not give any interviews without the express advance approval of somebody in authority, that is an overly broad policy. And the courts have struck these things down for decades, and yet people still somehow feel entitled to enforce them. And I think one of the reasons so many of these things are on the books, even though they're illegal, is that nobody challenges them. Why? Because that person you know, on the campus police force just doesn't feel that strongly about giving you an interview that they're willing to get a lawyer and spend two and a half years in federal court suing their boss. Right? That's not going to happen. Nobody is motivated to do it. The only time somebody's motivated to do it is when they get fired for violating the rule and they have nothing to lose anymore, right? That's the only time I would ever sue my employer. Otherwise, I don't want to talk to the media bad enough that I'm going to get an attorney. And so these policies just sort of persist out there in this limbo. It's kind of the Schrodinger's cat of uh, uh, the First Amendment. It's both alive and dead. Uh, uh, it is unenforceable, but it is enforced until such time as somebody challenges that. Um, at a private college, right, the First Amendment doesn't apply to our great disappointment. Um, at a private college, right, it's just an, any other business, and uh, they get to set their own rules and regulations. But like any other business, they are governed by federal labor law. And as certainly a college like Dartmouth is way big enough to be governed by federal labor law. If your mom's candy store, no. But if you're big enough like Dartmouth, um, you're governed by federal labor law. And federal labor law, too, says that if you tell all of your employees you are forbidden from speaking to the news media without advanced approval of somebody in authority, that is unlawful. And it's a violation of the National Labor Relations Act and the NLRB has, in fact, sanctioned employers for doing this. One of the employers they have sanctioned is the Trump Hotel and Casino in Atlantic City. Um, and so we know that this works. Um, we know that this is enforceable. If, and again, they can, they can enforce narrower policies. They could certainly say, right, don't give away our confidential information or our trade secrets. That they can say. But if it is a blanket prohibition on giving interviews, that goes too far and it is illegal. I see somebody was going to ask a question about that. Yeah. In case that the university doesn't actually consider its staff as employees, as, in, as in, like a university where the paper isn't paid, ah, right. how would that protect the rights of those? Yeah, so what I'm talking about is your sources' rights, not your rights, right? So the, the way this would play out is you go to that, let's say you go to a crime scene, right? And there's a campus police officer there. A campus police officer either says to you, I'm sorry, under university rules, I am forbidden from speaking to the media, or the campus police officer does speak to you and then gets punished for doing it, right? Gives you some information from the crime scene um, and then gets punished by their employer saying, I didn't authorize you to give that interview. I'm putting a note in your personnel file, or I'm suspending you, or I'm docking your pay, right? Answer is, you can't do that under the National Labor Relations Act. What were you going to say about that? Um, my question was like more about institutions that are at colleges. Yeah. Um, let's say UF Health Shands Hospital. Uh -huh. It is connected to UF, but their spokesperson um, strongly believes in employees not talking to journalists. Um, Gainesville Police is another example mm -hmm. where the spokesperson is really the only voice mm -hmm. of the police department. How yeah. does that work? How does this gag order work for those types of institutions? So, so the, thank you for asking. So these laws are not college specific at all. These are general principles for all workplaces. So a governmental workplace like the city of Gainesville police or a private workplace like a hospital would still be governed by these principles. And so if, let's just pick on the Gainesville police department, if they are telling their officers, no one here may speak to the news media without advanced consent, period, then that is an unlawfully broad policy and it is subject to being challenged. And somebody should be challenged. Um, this is, um, I, I didn't really introduce the work of the Brechner Center that much, where I'm brand new, actually, I've just been there a few months. Um, Brechner Center is sort of a think tank. It's a research center about the rights of journalists. And this is the first research paper that we're getting ready to publish, is this exact thing, because it is one of the major pain points that journalists at all levels, student as well as professional, report to us is this, um, what the Society 
professional journalist has started calling censorship by PIO, um, where you can't get access to any of the decision makers on campus because they're all funneled through somebody who uh, filters your access or sometimes doesn't even allow the access, right? Just says, um, no, 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 you can't talk to the police chief, but here's a prepared statement that you can use instead, and that's just as good, right? It's not just as good. Um, so at, at a private uh, uh, workplace, the only uh, kind of a, a, a exception that makes the NLR a right not as good as the First Amendment right is that the National Labor Relations Act does not apply to supervisory level personnel. What that means is, like a private hospital or a private medical center, they could tell their vice presidents and their department chairs, don't talk to the media. That they can do, because the NLRA is really about protecting sort of Joe laborers' rights, and about Joe low-ranking employee, that beat cop, or that researcher, or, by the way, a student employee like um, a, a TA or a grad assistant. Um, those people are clearly covered by the National Labor Relations Act because the NLRB has had those cases and they have said so, that if you're a grad assistant or a teaching assistant, then you have legally protected rights under the NLRA. Um, some of you remember, right, Northwestern University a couple years ago, somebody actually tried to bring this on behalf of football players to say that football players were employees and they had legally protected rights. And we're in complete limbo as to where that stands right now because the NLRB, the National Labor Relations Board, failed to take a conclusive position on it. And so we, we don't know. Um, but we certainly know as to kind of more ordinary, normal garden variety types of employees. So at that health center, you can't force them to uh, 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 free the vice president or the department heads for, to give interviews. But certainly, if that policy extends all the way down to the lower rungs of the uh, of, 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 the, uh, rank, of the ladder, then it is too broad, then it is too broad. And, and uh, one of the things we're doing at Breckner is sort of drawing a roadmap for journalists to be able to try to challenge these policies because we know that the employees themselves are not normally motivated to do that. And so um, there is kind of a precedent in the realm of gag orders at trials, right? Um, often a judge will gag the people who participate in a criminal trial and say all the jurors and all the lawyers and all the parties are all forbidden from talking to the media. The media then kind of steps into the shoes of those speakers and brings the claim on their behalf and says no, that order is too broad and the media almost always wins that. Um, and so there's a road map to do this um, in uh, gag orders at trials and we think that that road map could be followed by journalists to try to challenge these don't anyone talk. And of course, needless to say, write about this, right? Write about the fact that there is this policy on the books that is questionably legal um, and, and why, why it exists. Um, how many people here? Oh, go ahead, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just had a question about the religious uh, clause yeah. of that. So I go to Boston College, so it's a Catholic institution. So how does that work with this law? It, it, Boston College would not fit what the NLRB defines as like a predominantly or primarily religious institution. They're really thinking of like a seminary. They're thinking about somebody whose primary mission is the inculcation of religion, which BC is not. So yeah, like a BC would certainly qualify for this. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I have a question about um, anonymous sources. So no. our paper doesn't usually allow for anonymous sources because of the sake of integrity of our paper and to make sure that um, we're credible in what we say. But if there, um, if sources aren't willing to put their name on the record but are still willing to give statements uh, for fear of their job and for fear of retaliation in the future, is this something that would apply to them? Because they don't necessarily not have the right to speak. They just. Um, have the threat, like how can I reassure them that even if I put their name in the paper, they won't, you know, have any repercussions down the line? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I mean, it's a great set of questions there because two things. First of all, while this law provides that you cannot be punished purely for the act of giving the interview, right, it doesn't immunize you if you say something in the interview that somehow contravenes the policy of the institution, right? So if a person, a private institution? Yeah, private, private institution, right. At a private institution where the First Amendment doesn't apply, right? Where the First Amendment doesn't apply at a private institution, if the person were to just kind of open up both barrels on the institution, right? And say, this place is full of sexual harassment and they don't do anything about it, right? And, and put their name on it, it is possible that they would still be exposing themselves to being, thank you, to being punished by the institution, not for the act of giving the interview, but for the content of the interview. So uh, unfortunately, right, I, I don't know that you can 
give a lot of assurance to somebody who's kind of a true whistleblower who wants to share something, you know, embarrassing to the institution. I would not ever give anybody kind of a false sense of comfort, right? The other thing is, and I'm always careful to not give people false assurance that institutions won't act illegally, right? So even at a public institution, right? Like whistleblowing at a public institution, I feel very confident is protected by the First Amendment because, you know, this case law saying so, but I would never give somebody a false sense of assurance and say, yeah, you're fine, because people break the law, you know, and, and that's why the case is good to court, is because people get illegally fired and they have to spend two and a half years in court trying to get their jobs back. So that's the reality, right? I mean, the reality is, even when a student asks me, right, can I be disciplined for this or can I be disciplined for that? My answer is always, not legally, um, but that doesn't mean it won't happen, right? Uh, uh, and, and they're just like, legally, police can't erase your photographs, but we know it happens. So I think that's the reality, right? The reality is that no source is probably going to be all that comforted by your assurance. This is really more of sort of a policy-wise to make sure that institutions are not excessively inter interfering with your access to those um, sources in the first place and that people don't feel like they are legally constrained from speaking to you because they're just not. They're just not legally constrained from speaking to you. Thank you for raising that. Um, so I know we have a lot of private institutions here so you probably don't rely uh, in your day-to-day -day practice on uh, public records laws because we know they don't work at private institutions. But um, for those of you that do, for those of you that need access to records, or for those of you who have tried to just get somebody to talk to you on campus, who's gotten the FERPA answer here? Who's gotten the answer, can't talk to you, can't provide you documents because FERPA privacy forbids it? I see a couple of people who have gotten that, right? So here's the reality about that. Um, FERPA is kind of like that wizard in the Wizard of Oz who you know, is big and scary until you look behind the curtain and it's really a little tiny man who's not that scary at all. And the myth of what is covered by FERPA is so much greater than the reality of what is covered by FERPA. FERPA is the federal student privacy law. It was passed in 1974 to protect all of your education records. And that is what the law says, that if an institution is in possession of education records, then they must observe a policy and a practice of keeping those records confidential. That is what it says. Well, over the years, due to some aggressive lawyering by colleges and schools and frankly some bad training, people have come to believe that FERPA applies to anything and everything whatsoever about students even though the Supreme Court and the U.S. Department of Ed have clearly said otherwise. To give you an example, I'm just at a campus um, uh, in, uh, in, in uh, uh, Indiana where we were talking about this the other day. So let's say some kind of an uh, incident happens inside of a classroom. There's some violent incident. You know, somebody uh, uh, pulls out a gun or, or the, that uh, altercation inside of a classroom. It's newsworthy, right? And you want to ask the instructor, what happened in your classroom? What, what went down in your classroom? Can the instructor share their observations of what went down in the classroom without violating FERPA? Answer, yes, they can do that. What the Department of Ed has said is if it is information that you saw with your own two eyes and that's what you are being asked to share, then that is not an education record. Right? Education record means record. It means I can't, as a professor, and I am now, I can't read your transcripts to somebody. I can't read your attendance sheet to somebody. I can't read your disciplinary record to somebody. But that's really all it needs. It's about those records. Remember when you were in high school and you got in trouble and they told you this is going on your permanent record? That's what FERPA is about. It's about your permanent record. It's about those things that are stored in the dean's office and the registrar's office that, of course, are nobody's business but yours. But what they're not about is anything and everything that pertains to a student. And so there's really a lot of latitude for institutions to comment on things that involve students as long as they're being asked for just their personal recollection. Here's where this came up recently, just to give you an example. So there was a trial going on in Kentucky involving uh, a Title IX complaint brought by a former student athlete who claimed to have been sexually abused by other student athletes um, and claimed that the university kind of turned a blind eye to this sexual abuse case. It, frankly, you go to any state in America and find one of these cases. Uh, it's a sadly commonplace pattern right now. Um, the university took the position that their coach could not sit in a deposition and give testimony about what he knew and when he knew it about the athletes, claiming that his personal recollections of what he knew and when he knew it about the athletes were covered by FERPA, 
Well, the judge said, no, you must sit and you must answer those questions because FERPA doesn't cover your mental impressions and your observations. It only covers records. So again and again, the courts have said that FERPA is a narrow statute, despite what you may be told by your institution. This much we know for sure because it is in the statute. This is right in the federal law that records maintained by law enforcement agency are not education records. So if you're going to your campus police, your campus security office, and all the police reports all have the names blacked out on the grounds of FERPA, that was a good answer in 1987. It is not a good answer now, because Congress changed the law decades ago to say that police reports are not FERPA education records. Um, also, if you have a student conduct hearing at your campus, and at the end of that student conduct hearing, the disciplinary board decides that a person committed a crime of violence or a sex crime, aggravated assault, rape, aggravated battery, something like that. If they render a guilty verdict, only guilty, not an innocent verdict, if they find that the person did it, then the outcome of that disciplinary process, says Congress, is no longer covered by FERPA. What does that mean? That means that a private institution, if you were to ask, um, did Joe Quarterback get found liable for sexual assault, they can tell you that. They can tell you, yes. Joe Quarterback was suspended for two years from college for the offense of sexual assault, and none of that violates FERPA. At a private college, they can tell you that. At a public college, they should tell you that. At a public college, that should be a matter of public record that you can get by way of a freedom of information request. Um, question? Yeah. 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 Um, currently, we're working on, unfortunately, it was a student death back at our university, and it's potentially a, a hazing incident. Wow. One of the things that were, since it happened over spring break, it probably happened off campus. One of the things that <coughs> we're worried about running into is our dean of students or university president saying, we can't comment on that because of FERPA. What will we have to say to that? Yeah, I mean, there's all kinds of things that they can say there. For one thing, did the, do you know if the person had hit 18 years of age yet? He was a freshman, he was 18, yeah. At, once you hit 18 years of age, then the Department of Ed says, and I'm happy to send you this letter from the Department of Ed, once you turn 18, the Department of Ed says that your FERPA right transfers from your parents to you. So at the point that that young man died, he was the owner of the FERPA privacy right. And guess what? It dies with you. It dies with you. And so he's got no FERPA privacy. So they can tell you any, hell, they can show you his transcripts. They could literally show you his transcripts. I mean, I'm happy, but if they could, right, they, they, there's nothing about that young man's life or death that is protected by FERPA anymore. The U.S. Department of Ed has said so. Um, so there's that, right? The, the, the individual himself has no FERPA privacy. They may raise, obviously, the privacy of the people who are accused in the hazing, right? And, and it is true that if you go through the disciplinary process and either the process isn't done yet or they're not convicted of a crime of violence, um, then they probably really truly can't tell you anything identifiable about the individuals. But they should still release factual narrative that is not identifiable about the individuals. And I feel like there's a, just a really compelling kind of a moral argument in addition to the legal argument that they should be doing so. And one of the ways that I've found most effective to push back against these kind of overbroad claims of, of FERPA is to show examples of other places where the same level of detail has been released already, right? Because if, if FERPA applies, then literally the U.S. Department of Ed can swoop in and close your school down and take all their federal money away, which, by the way, has never happened. Not in the 42 years that that statute has been in the books. It hasn't happened a single time ever. Okay? So we know that it is the death penalty, and it is only meant for an institution that just wantonly gives away student records for no good reason. Right? It's not going to happen to your institution, because it's never happened. Um, but it, like with hazing, a good uh, resource to show them is um, South Carolina actually passed a law a couple years ago called the James Hip Act after a student who was killed in a hazing incident. And as a result of the HIPS Act, um, there is an online database of every hazing case at colleges in South Carolina. So I've shown that to people before to say, hey, look, you think that hazing cases are confidential under FERPA? Here is an online description of all of these hazing cases. If it violated FERPA, how could South Carolina be enforcing this law, right? I mean, it's been on the book a couple years now. They haven't closed down any of these colleges, and they're publishing the hazing information. So sometimes it's as simple as that, just showing them, like, look, if you think FERPA applies here, let me show you a bunch of other institutions that are already giving this same stuff out.
thanks for raising that. So uh, that's, that's FERPA. I want to dive from there into just showing you some specific resources where you can get stories. And some of this may be new and some of it may be by way of review. I'm going to hit these pretty quick, but then leave a couple of minutes if somebody wants to go back and ask questions about them. Um, who here has seen the IRS Form 990 for their institution? Who here has seen that? A few of you have and a few have not. At a private institution especially, this is your Bible. This is as close as you're going to get to ever seeing the budget of your institution, right? Because you know, a private institution is never going to hand over their budget. They don't have to obey public records acts. What you do have to do is file these tax returns every year with the IRS. And if you're even at a public institution, there's every chance that they have a private nonprofit arm or affiliate of some kind, a health center, an athletic association, an alumni association, a fundraising foundation. All those things, if you're incorporated as a private nonprofit, you have to file your tax returns with the IRS every year, and those are public record, and we get to see them. And so I would be making this a yearly check that I do, and unfortunately, the, these kind of, they're filed helter-skelter across the, the, the year. Technically, they're supposed to be filed like in about August 1st every year, but lots of people get extensions, and so people will ask me, when are these filed? The answer is kind of, over the course of the latter half of the year, they will trickle in. But um, these are online at, there's a website called guidestar.org, guidestar.org. It is a free service, costs you nothing, just start an account with an email address, and you can search by the name of the institution. But I would search lots of different ways. I remember like at University of Alabama, they were mystified, they couldn't find their athletic association for a while, and then they realized it didn't have University of Alabama in the name, it had something like you know Crimson Elephants or something. And, and so by searching in different ways and different permutations, they were able to come up with that. What this will show you is a snapshot of the financial performance of the institution. How much money is coming in? How much is going out? Um, how are their investments doing? Are they making or losing money? Um, are we doing better or worse than we were a year ago? Um, major categories of expenses, including the biggest contracts at every institution every year. What do you think is the biggest contract that your institution does every year? Just yell out. What do you think is the biggest contract that they do? What would be like a contractual relationship with buying services from somebody? The services workers? Service workers might be, although probably they don't contract, I don't know, directly with um, um, the union. Uh, uh, their contract might be with the individuals there. I'm thinking like a Sodexo food services, right? Those are biggies. Those are the food services right up there. Construction is right up there. Sometimes law firms are right up there. If they had especially bad year, um, um, sometimes law firms will be right up there. So you get to see this is how much we paid to those firms on a yearly basis. And you will see the salaries of the top executives. Um, this is for private institutions, right? In a public institution, you get a you just get the budget, right? You should be able to use the, your, your Open Records Act or UF um, to get the budget. You don't have to do that, but you should still look to see, is there a private nonprofit arm or affiliate of my public university? Because this is the way to get behind the curtain of those otherwise private um, um, entities.